David, one of my obsessions is to understand the nature of reality. Sounds crazy. But time is one of the most fundamental aspects to understand. And most of my physicist and philosopher friends are now saying that time is really not real, that, it's, uh, that it emerges from something more fundamental. And some very interesting physics that, that's behind it. But I'm wondering if there is a different view that we can take from neuroscience, from psychophysics, to understand the human perception so that we can understand what the physicists say their equations are saying, but understand how we're experiencing it as well and see what kind of correlations make sense. Here's what neuroscience tells us, is that time isn't what we once thought it was. So this much we know, that we're not passively tracking the river of time, but instead the brain is actively constructing it. And here's how we know that. So in my laboratory, for example, I can make you think that something lasted longer or shorter in duration than it actually did, as measured by a clock. Or I can make you think that something came before something else, even though it was the other way around. Mm. Or I can make you think that something is flickering at a very different rate than it actually is. So I can do all these experiments in the laboratory, and what that means is your brain and my brain might look at the same thing, and just depending on how I set things up, we can see completely different things. So what does that mean? It means time is, is not Newton's time, where it's the T in the equation that just moves forward and then everything else can be hung on that. So Einstein, of course, came after Newton and said, look, depending on your frame of reference, things can get stretched or squished, depending on how fast you're going. But it's a lot worse than that. There's a neural relativity going on. So what does it tell us about outside objective time? Well, it's hard to say. At minimum, it means that it's, it can run differently than subjective time. At most, it means that maybe the whole thing is illusory. Maybe the whole thing is a construction of the brain in the same way that colors don't actually exist in the outside world. All you have is electromagnetic radiation of different wavelengths, and your brain constructs color. Maybe the brain constructs time. And there's no such thing as that. Now, of course, it's completely bizarre for us to try to wrap our heads around, but this is the sense in which time might be one of the most stubborn psychological filters by which we're experiencing the world. And, and it's hard to reach behind that, just in, just in the same way that it's hard to imagine that there's only electromagnetic radiation and not real <laughs> light in the right, world, right? right? I mean, you're just as a your brain is is locked in darkness inside your skull. Your brain doesn't see it doesn't experience light or photons itself. It only gets conversions into electrical signals of photons, and it literally lights up the world, and you see this whole thing here. Okay, so there are really two, two issues here. One is what happens in the outside world, and one what happens in the inside world. What you're saying, for sure, is that the inside world, the subjective sense of time, is flexible. It's, there's a lot of plasticity to it because of how other things happen in our, in our heads. Right. There's no doubt about that. That's we may true. have doubts about what's happening in the outside world. We have no doubt internally that, that we will have different senses of time. Exactly. Okay. So um, does that, though, tell us anything about the outside world? It tells us our we have to be weary of our perceptions, but, but maybe we, we then can accept equations but n not worry about, and be, just eliminate our own perception. There, there's, no, there's no sort of final killer thing that our, our perception of time in the neuroscience laboratory tells us about the physics. It doesn't answer the question once and for all. It does illustrate very deeply, though, that we have these psychological filters that we take as intuitive. And we know that physicists, being humans, mm. build their theories on top of our, our intuitions. Right. And so the whole notion of time, this has been a debate for a very long time, whether time actually exists or not, and, and this at least gives us the sense that we can't assume time is sort of a categorical, fundamental thing in the outside world. We can't make that assumption with the same, um, you know, freedom that we used to. We know that there's something really strange going on internally. Okay. Physicists and uh, philosophers talk in time in many different ways. One of the ways they categorize it in three ways. One is that time has a, uh, has a, a now. It has a now to us. And 
Nobody knows how long this now is because our memories retain what we had from a few seconds ago and we sort of know what we're going to see. And I can't tell you whether my now with you is one second long or a, a hundredth or a thousandth of a second long because it's all, when I look at it, it's already gone and I'm on to the next one. So there's the question of now. There's the question of the flow of time that I, we sense we have this movement. And then there's an arrow of time that sends that I'm going from the past and through this unusual now, whatever that is, and I'm going into the future. So on these three dimensions, uh, what do we learn from neuroscience? About the arrow of time, nothing. But about the now, there's some really extraordinary things that we've learned. So here's what I've put together over the last 11 years. Um, the challenge of the brain is that it's picking up information through very different senses. So sight and hearing and touch. All of these process information in very different ways with different architectures inside the brain and at different speeds. And so what that means is when I knock on the table, mm. I see it and I feel it and I hear it all at the same time, it seems. But in fact, those signals are getting processed at totally different speeds in different right. parts of my brain. Right. And the challenge for the brain is it has to put those all together, has to collect up all the signals, compare those across the senses, stitch them together, figure out what happened in time, and then serve up a conscious story about what happened. By the time that happens, I'm living in the past. When I think the moment now occurs, it's already yeah. happened a long time ago, actually, right. probably about half a second ago. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's very clear is that even though we feel like we're experiencing things as they happen, we're not. And um, uh, I wrote a, a paper in Science in the year 2000 that showed that if, we're, if, if an event happens in time, what we think happened in that moment is actually influenced by information that happened after that. Things that happened in the future of the event wow, wow. influence what we think we saw at the time of the event. And it's because information is still pouring in and getting congealed and new information manipulates that. What, uh, how long in the future do you have? It's about 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second. Okay. So something happening within a tenth of a second after an event can make you change what you thought that event was. Precisely. And you think you're seeing the event now, but it's already happened a long time ago. Well, one of the things that, that really shocked me when you understand how the nervous system works, and you think you understand it, and then you learn that in terms of senses coming into the brain, that there's more brain uh, uh, fibers going from the cerebral cortex down to lower centers, relay stations for the centers, than information coming up. I mean, that superficially seems bizarre. That's right. That's exactly right. So if you take the visual system as an example, you have cells from the retina going to the what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then that goes to visual cortex. And so you've got a certain number of fibers running from LGN to cortex and 10 times more coming from the cortex to the ten LGN. 10 times. That's unbelievable. Here's, here's the thing. It's exactly what you would expect from a system that's actually all about internally generated activity that has expectations about what it's going to see next. And all you're actually passing up the line is, did I get my prediction right? <laughs> so it's all about saying, okay, I'm in a room, I'm looking at Robert, I think this is what's approximately happening. And if suddenly you turn into a flower, <laughs> then poof, I'd send up a big error signal to the rest of my visual system. Oh. But as long as things are about what I thought they were, <laughs> I don't have to send up a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that, how does that affect our sense of time? Ah, well, the general story is you have to cross vast landscapes of brain territory in order to get your story together, in mm. order to get stuff going. Mm. And something I realized a while ago, which really surprised me, is if I touch your toe and your nose at the same time, you'll feel those as simultaneous. Well, that's bizarre because the signals from your nose reach your brain very quickly, and from your toe, it has to climb all the way up your spinal cord. Right, right. So somehow, when your brain detects the signals from the nose, it's as though it says, okay, well, I'm not going to perceive this yet until I see what else is coming up the pipeline. <laughs> and it doesn't. And what that means is that it might be that the, that the amount you live in the past depends on how tall you are. It depends on how long it takes for all your brain signals to come together. Yeah.